please allow me to now introduce our speakers for today's session. Dr. Naomi Meeks, Assistant Professor, Genetics and Metabolism with Children's Hospital Colorado. Sarah Stewart, Instructor and Certified Genetics Counselor, Genetics and Metabolism with Children's Hospital Colorado. And Mindy Taylor, Parent Founder and Clinic Coordinator for the 22Q Deletion Syndrome Program. Thank you all again for joining us today. Now let's begin. So we'll get started talking about 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. Some of our goals for today, we'll discuss a specific case, uh, review the genetics of 22Q and the testing methods, uh, discuss some of the signs, symptoms, and management, and then discuss uh, transition to adult care and some psychosocial aspects of 22Q. So my name is Mindy Taylor, and I am the proud parent to Lauren, who is now age 23 and is pictured here um, near the age of her first, when she was first diagnosed with 22Q deletion syndrome. I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of background as to how we um, came upon this diagnosis. And it really truly was kind of a stumbling upon this diagnosis, which um, is something we oftentimes um, see with this condition. So um, during the course of the pregnancy was uneventful um, with the exception of development of low fluid near the near term and so labor was induced and she had strong apgar scores nothing usual unnoted um, although i do remember being a new young kind of scared mother and when i was burping her uh, she noticed i noticed like a huge amount of spit up come through her nose and so this nasal regurgitation i remember asking one of the nurses on the hospital floor about that and she said oh honey don't worry about that it's all connected and so that may be true it's also now that we know i know looking back at the hallmark sign of what's called vpi or velopharyngeal insufficiency which is associated with an abnormal palate so i took lauren home and the next few years she thrived and she grew and uh, though she was on the fifth to tenth um, percentile for her height she maintained that growth trajectory, so it didn't ring any kind of alarm bells to um, her pediatrician. Uh, she had, you know, things like constipation. She had bad teeth, so basically all of her teeth were rotting out of her mouth at age three, three and a half, essentially as soon as they grew in, and I didn't understand why, so we had a bunch of extensive dental work done. You can see in the picture with the polka dot shirt um, a lot of her teeth there are reconstructed or capped at that point. Um, this was still pre-diagnosis. Um, the other little kind of small things that we had noted about Lauren prior to diagnosis, as you can see this ear in the um, picture on the right-hand side, she has one normal-shaped ear. The ear that is, so is there at the top, it's kind of just pinched. Um, so that was just kind of an odd finding. Um, one of the other things that we noticed is if you look at her pointer finger down here, you'll see that it's very subtle, but the digits are all tapered at the end. And so you can see very, very subtle features here that are, we know now are associated with 22Q deletion syndrome. So she is meeting all of her mo motor milestones. She's socially engaging. She's growing. She's thriving. Um, she did have um, what I would call um, some bouts where she was having some respiratory distress that was landing us in hypoxia. It was landing us in the emergency department um, in terms of blue lips not being able to breathe. Uh, it was diagnosed as a viral induced asthma. It was treated with steroids. And so we assumed that that was an accurate diagnosis. Um, and it wasn't until um, she was about age four that I noticed so she was growing and thriving. She was meeting all of her motor milestones with the exception of her speech and language development. She seemed to lag in terms of being able to express herself. So I took her to a speech language pathologist who referred me to an ear, nose, throat provider who um, back in the day, we had a fellow come in and I think he must have 
been orally dictating to a microphone or something, making himself uh, notes. And he had noted during a physical exam that she had a submucosal cleft palate and a bifid uvula. And um, I wrote that term down. And uh, they sent us on our merry way. We went home and got on Google and popped in the term submucosal cleft palate, which is pretty specific to the 22Q, and up popped a uh, veal cardiofacial syndrome uh, list of associated findings. And that finding was on there, along with some of these other very subtle findings, like the tapered fingers, maybe the, the chronic constipation, some ear abnormalities, um, some of these other things that I had noticed with Lauren. So I ended up calling the ENT office back, asking for a fish for 22Q. And thanks to Google Doc, we got a diagnosis. So now that we know a little bit about uh, some of the experiences with diagnosis of 22Q deletion syndrome, we'll talk more about it on a genetic level. So 22Q deletion syndrome, goes by a lot of different names like the George syndrome, velocardiofacial syndrome, conotruncal anomaly face syndrome. And this really highlights that there is the variability of expressivity or the variability of what types of symptoms kids and adults with this condition have. So before there was a known underlying genetic mechanism that unified what was going on with all these children and adults with these features, it was called based on what features were seen or what, um, who discovered the constellation of features. And once they were able to do chromosomal testing and identify the unifying uh, deletion on chromosome 22, the more um, kind of inclusive name 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome came. This is the most common micro deletion syndrome with a rate of about one in 4,000 live births which is why it's really important to be able to recognize some of these broad features um, and recognize how to do testing and how this happens. 22Q uh, deletion syndrome um, is actually a variably sized deletion ranging from about 1.5 to 3 megabases deletions in this region. Um, how it gets its name is really telling us where the deletion is. So the 22Q is referring to chromosome 22. The Q is talking about which arm on this chromosome. So Q is representing the long arm, which we can see over in this picture here. And the 11.2 is really just zooming in on what locus. The reason we see such frequent deletions in this area is because it's flanked by something called low copy number repeats which are actually common throughout the genome. And what they are are these repetitive sequences um, or homologous sequences throughout chromosomes. And what happens if they're flanking a region is it can lead to misalignment during meiosis. So basically during crossing over events, there can be misalignments and the incorrect uh, information can cross over, creating deletions on one copy of chromosome 22 and duplications on the other. And then once um, the egg and or in the egg and the sperm, it can have um, the incorrect number or amount of information on chromosome 22. Um, theoretically, this would mean that we should see 22Q duplication syndrome just as frequently, but we really don't observe 22Q duplication syndrome as much as we see 22Q deletion syndrome. For testing for 22Q deletion syndrome, there's really two ways to go about it. Um, there's the FISH study that Mindy had talked about, which is fluorescence in situ hybridization study, which is really targeted towards um, a specific locus. So you can fish specifically for 22Q deletion syndrome by flagging um, locus on chromosome 22 to say, is it there or is it not? This is what the picture on the slide is showing with the green flag being um, a control flag to say, where is chromosome 22 in general? And then the pink flag is flagging um, the re region of 22Q deletion syndrome specifically. So as you can see from this picture, um, only one pink flag is there saying there's only one copy of this region. Chromosomal microarray is another way you can test 
for this condition. And that's really a broader test. It's looking across all of the genetic information for copy number variants or additional or missing information to say, is there anywhere along any of the chromosomes that has these copy number variants? So it can test for 22Q deletion syndrome, but it is not a specific test for that. It can detect any other uh, micro deletions or micro duplication syndromes as well. Notably, karyotype, which would be looking at a broad picture of chromosomes on a large scale, would not be the most appropriate test for, to target 22Q deletion syndrome. It is useful in cases where there's rearrangements or translocations that are causing the absence of information at 22Q11.2 locus. Uh, but given the small size of the deletion, karyotype really isn't ideal if we're trying to find it, or karyotype in, on its own. Which brings us to the question of what is the best test for 22Q deletion syndrome for one of those fish studies targeting specifically 22Q deletion or a chromosomal microarray, which is looking much broader. So some of the features we know of 22Q deletion syndrome include things we've talked about, like some of the language delays, um, some structural differences, uh, the VPI. And some of these, though, are big red flags for 22Q. They're not necessarily specific to 22Q. So when we see kids who have things like developmental disabilities or congenital anomalies, uh, there are a lot of other uh, copy number variant conditions where it could be. And actually the American Association, or sorry, the Association of Medical Genomics has um, released statements for chromosomal microarray being the first tier tested, recommended for individuals with developmental delays or congenital abnormalities, which a lot of kids with 22Q fall under the window. So the benefit would be for a chromosomal microarray, you are be able to get at other underlying causes. However, when we're thinking about the consent process with families, when we're testing for more than one condition, the consent process does look different than if we're just targeting 22Q deletion syndrome uh, through FISH. So that's just an important consideration if you're thinking about ordering uh, testing for 22Q and how to talk about this with families. 22Q is usually a de novo condition. This means that usually the person who's affected is the first member of their family to have 22Q and it's not inherited. We see this about 90 to 95% of the time when it would be a random change in either the egg or the sperm that caused that deletion, usually through the misalignment during meiosis that we had talked about earlier with uh, crossing over events and this causes their child to have 22Q. About 5 to 10% of the time it is inherited, and when it is, it's inherited in what's called an autosomal dominant fashion. What this means for the autosomal part is that the sex does not matter, so boys and girls can both have 22Q deletion syndrome, and it can be passed from mothers or fathers to any sex of child. The dominant part is talking about the chance of passing it on. So we all have two copies, of our chromosome 22, and having one copy with the deletion is sufficient to have the condition. However, as we've said, there is a lot of different symptoms associated with 22Q deletion syndrome. So just the presence of having this deletion does not inform us what type of symptoms uh, the individual might have. For example, uh, two siblings who both have 22Q deletion syndrome might not look the exact same. They might be affected with different features of the condition. It's also important that sometimes um, individuals can be more mildly impacted. So sometimes we can diagnose children with 22Q deletion syndrome and end up diagnosing a parent who previously was thought to be unaffected. And just briefly of note, uh, it's important to consider the differences between 22Q deletion syndrome and 22Q distal deletion syndrome. So as you can see uh, from this photo, there's the um, hot spot or the critical region for 22Q deletion syndrome. And sometimes there's deletions that uh, from a nomenclature perspective look like it's the same deletion, but actually do not include that critical region. Um, it's just important to make sure that if you have a live report to read it carefully to make sure that it is the 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome or George syndrome, 
or this critical region uh, opposed to the distal deletion syndrome. Just to make sure when you're disclosing this to a family, uh, you're disclosing the correct diagnosis and giving them the correct resources. All right, and, I, and I'll add that if you get a report like that and you're not sure, um, uh, that you could um, always give the on-call geneticist a call and have them review the information so that we can help make sure that you're, you're conveying the correct result and then obviously get that patient connected with our um, genetics clinic. Um, so, um, but what I wanna move on to talk about is um, some of the, the physical and medical features of 22Q to kind of help you um, recognize some of those subtle things as well as um, know better what sorts of medical issues that these um, patients may have. Um, and so I'll start by talking about some of the dysmorphic features and um, Mindy did a nice job of pointing out some of the, uh, some of those things on Lauren. Um, but on, I'll, I have a, a picture from a publication on this slide so we can cover some of those as well. Um, so you can see by looking at this little boy um, that he's got a rather long, thin face. Um, and that is for, it's harder to tell from the front, but that his forehead is somewhat prominent um, when you look at kind of the overall features of his face. Yet many of the other features are more, uh, are smaller in scale. He has a narrow jaw, a narrow chin. Um, he has hypoplastic, uh, underdeveloped nares. So when you're looking straight on at his face, you can see that his nares are quite small compared to the size of his nose. Um, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> the, um, his nose is long and it's relatively broad. One um, feature that I see very commonly is that if you look at the top part of the nose between the eyes over the bridge of the nose, um, and then compare it down to the um, tip of the nose. It kind of, the width of the nose pretty much stays the same. Most people, the bridge of their nose is narrower up at the top and then their, their nose tends to widen out as they get um, lower on the face. But you can see it's kind of um, the same top to bottom. So next slide. Um, you can also look at his eyes and note they're a little bit hooded so that you know as we look straight at his face, we're not looking at the tops of his eyelashes. What we're looking at is the skin um, from his eye, um, his eyelids are sort of hanging down over the top part of his eyes. Um, you can see that his ears stick out a little bit. Um, in, in, in this picture, his ears are asymmetric, that one sticks out more than the other. Um, and then you can notice that his upper lip tends to be very thin. Um, that's pretty common. A lot of times when you see pictures of these kids, their mouth will actually be kind of hanging open, often reflecting their low muscle tone. So their upper lip, their thin upper lip often makes sort of a triangular shape um, for these patients. And that has to do with both their muscle tone and some of the differences that we can see in how their palate um, and the upper part of their mouth develops. Um, so as uh, Sarah and many have both alluded to, um, there's many different um, symptoms that can be part of 22Q deletion. This is a nice diagram that sort of reflects every um, body system that could be involved and um, that we need to be thinking about in children with this diagnosis. Um, but it is extremely variable. So I always tell families that um, your, your child may have one, some, or many of these, these symptoms. Um, most of the time, people with 22Q Q deletion don't have no symptoms. Um, I think everybody has some kind of symptoms, but some may be more mild than others, um, and some be, may be more subtle or sort of overlooked as an isolated symptom. Um, and we'll go through some of these in the next slide. Can go ahead and next slide. Yep. So um, one of the most prominent symptoms um, that we see in 22Q deletion kiddos is um, congenital heart defects. Um, when, as you can see, most individuals, more than 70% do have some sort of congenital heart defect. So it's really the minority of patients that don't. Um, but usually this is how we make our diagnoses at the beginning, is that a baby is born with a condition, um, a, a conal truncal defect like tetralogy of below, truncus arteriosus, interrupted aortic arch. Um, all of these conditions are um, tip-offs that you might need to be thinking about 22Q deletion. And so our um, cardiology colleagues have gotten quite um, comfortable ordering fish studies 
to look for 22Q deletion in many of these patients. And we often get referrals from um, our cardiac ICU or our cardiac unit um, because those babies have been um, admitted after birth for management or repair of those congenital heart defects. Um, but about one in 68 children born with congenital heart disease does have 22Q deletion. So it is something that should be on your radar. Um, but particularly if they present with any other associated symptoms. Um, people like Lauren, who did not have a major congenital heart defect when she was born, may, may have escaped notice for this diagnosis because she didn't have that. Um, that the symptoms um, beyond congenital heart defect sometimes may be quite subtle and overlooked easily. Next slide. Um, as, uh, as was already mentioned, palatal differences is a significant um, symptom seen in many of, or if not most of these children. Um, so the, um, the, as the roof of the mouth forms, the, the, this region of 22Q deletion is very important. Um, you, even if you have a, the presence of a palate, it doesn't mean that the palate form normally or that the muscles behind, behind the palate form normally. And so that can present in a range of, of um, ways, including the velopharyngeal incompetence, our submucous cleft palate, or even a cleft palate. Um, this, these palatal differences can present significant challenges for um, children or babies when they're born for being able to eat and swallow in a coordinated way. Um, we can also see significant challenges related to um, the development of speech and articulation difficulties. Um, and so by and large, pretty much every child that I've met with 22Q deletion does require some sort of a speech therapy to help with um, articulation, um, among other things. So next slide. Oh, and also I, sh I should note that I'm including a picture of uh, a child with 22Q deletion on every one of these slides because I figure the more visuals you have, the more you can appreciate um, some of these uh, unique features that we've already touched on. And so maybe the next time you see a child, you might be a little bit closer to being able to recognize it um, in person. But the kids, as you can tell, are pretty typical looking. I don't think that most of the time there's somebody that you would pick out if you were walking down the street or in the mall or you know out and about like you normally are. Most of the, the kids don't look significantly different or dysmorphic, the symptoms that, or the features are more subtle. Um, Hypoparathyroidism um, resulting in hypocalcemia is al also common in ch children with 22Q deletion. Um, and this can manifest actually at any time of life. Um, and in particular, we, we are concerned about it with times of um, metabolic stress. So I usually counsel my families that if the child is sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, or if they're getting a surgery, that their calcium levels need to be monitored um, to ensure that they're not dropping precipitously. Next slide. Um, neurologic complications are, are very common, specifically learning difficulties. Almost everybody um, that I see has some sort of developmental delays, um, sometimes not gross motor, um, sometimes gross motor, sometimes not. Um, but often it becomes most apparent once children get to the school age and there may be difficulty um, meeting um, grade level requirements. Seizures are also seen in 22Q deletion, but are not as common as some of the other symptoms. Um, there are a handful, a handful of other um, rare neurologic complications that can be seen, but the learning difficulties tends to be um, the, the main one that most children, that we do see in all children. So next slide. Um, immune deficiencies um, are also common. Um, this is because the, the thymus is still kind of in that same midline region where the parathyroid hormone, parathyroid gland is, the palate, all of those are, are all kind of midline defects and the 22Q deletion impacts the development of those organs. Um, and so with thymic abnormalities, you can get um, different immune deficiencies, but T cell function defects, antibody deficiencies, and and these can actually emerge at any point in life, um, but we do recommend that all children with, um, with uh, 22Q deletion be screened for these. Some children we even pick up on the newborn screen. The Colorado newborn screen now does do um, newborn testing for severe combined immune deficiency, 
and some of our children fall um, on the severe end of the spectrum for immune deficiencies. So we've had multiple um, individuals refer to our clinic because they flagged positive on the um, newborn screen, screen for SCID. Um, and then they go see the immunologist. The immunologists have, have begun to recognize this and we'll see testing for 22Q deletion as well. Next slide. Um, GI complications, you know, I've had 30% on this slide, which came out of a, a publication I was reviewing, but I actually, I would say that it's, it's much more than that based on personal experience. I alluded to that the velopharyngeal insufficiency um, and incompetence can lead to feeding difficulties in, new, in, the, in the newborn period. Um, but, and, and, and so we do see a lot of children in the hospital um, initially who are there for congenital heart defect management, but often will need to go home with um, NG or G2 feeding. Um, the, they can also, um, this can also present um, as uh, dysmotility and constipation. I think every child I see has constipation. Um, so there's a lot of dysmotility problems in the gut as well. Um, and this is likely related to low muscle tone, um, which we see globally in children with 22Q deletion. Okay, next slide. Um, and then um, psychiatric disorders are a prominent component. So I usually say that um, the, the biggest issues for young children and babies are usually related to congenital heart defects, usually related to feeding, usually, and then usually need to address thing like, things like speech in those first few years of life. But after those first few years of life, most of those medical issues are, are managed um, and they, are on, they require ongoing management, but they're pretty stable. But the um, psychiatric disorders become more and more prevalent um, in the school age children and beyond. Um, so many of our patients have ADHD. Anxiety is a frequent pre presenting um, symptom in our children. They tend to be happy and social and interactive, but just very anxious about doing those things. So as I always explain, they want to be involved, they want to have friends, they want to do those things, but they get very nervous about doing those. Um, next slide, adolescent, as we move on, um, anxiety continues to be a major symptom, but they are at risk for developing other mood disorders like depression. Um, and then there, there does start to be the risk for things like psychotic um, symptoms. Um, and so schizophrenia is a condition that is at higher um, prevalence in 22Q deletion. And sometimes those symptoms may start to manifest in um, the adolescent age group. So I usually counsel our families that um, at, at the time of adolescence that they need to be aware of those things, that they need to be, try to have discussions with their kids about them. Um, and, and that if they do experience any of those kinds of things, um, things where they're seeing things that aren't there or hearing things that aren't there, um, that we can help um, them get established with a psychiatrist and those symptoms can be managed often with medication. Um, and then in adults, like I said, schizophrenia is seen in almost a quarter of the patients. Um, the <clears throat> Uh, and so this can be a significant um, factor in the functioning of adults. And so making sure that they get established with good psychiatric care in adolescence, I think is really important because if those things can be managed in adolescence and they can establish care in the mental health community, I think it really improves their ability to be able to um, be more productive as they get to adulthood. You can see there's other mood disorders there as well. All right. And then of course, there are many, many, many other clinical features of 22Q deletion that we have not covered. Um, and so the, <clears throat> it, it's just kind of important to know that there are a lot of things that can come up as part of this diagnosis. Um, next slide. Um, and that everybody is unique. And I joke that they, the kids do not read textbooks, so they don't always know what features they're supposed to have. They can kind of show up with anything. Um, but we do have some certain patterns that we often see, and that's kind of what I've tried to show you today. Next slide. Um, so how do, how do we address all of those issues? Well, um, there's different setups in different parts of the country, but I can tell you that here um, we've established the 22Q deletion multidisciplinary clinic where we see patients um, in a clinic once a month um, where um, we try to have um, a, 
all of their needed appointments scheduled at the same time so they can see multiple provi providers at one visit. Um, and so we have specialists from out most departments in the hospital that see our patients. The, um, fortunately, we don't have to make it up what we do because there have been some very nice practice guidelines that have been published for the management of patients with 22Q deletion syndrome. And I've um, uh, put the publications out there here um, so that you can see that those are there. We, in the pediatric world, we manage children and we tend to manage them here at Children's Colorado up until um, age 21, sometimes a little beyond. Um, but then un unfortunately, just due to the size of our clinic and be being able to accommodate infants that are born with this condition, we can't continue to follow them throughout their lives. And, and that gets where things get a little more tricky. Um, and where often the primary care uh, providers come into um, higher importance for the management piece. Um, and so there are nice guidelines for managing adults with 22Q deletion syndrome as well. Both of the links to both of these articles are included at the, in the references section of these slides. Um, so next slide. Um, the pediatric guidelines um, are, are, are quite extensive, but this is a really nice summary of kind of what we do to make sure that the kids are getting their needs met. Um, and so we would try to address all of the relevant um, areas um, at the appropriate ages and throughout our clinic. Next slide. So, and so I wanted to also give you guys a little bit more information about adults with 22Q deletion. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the medical complications usually sort of settle out. They get less, um, less problematic and are more stable. Um, at an adulthood, but really the, the challenges in adulthood come with management of the psychiatric symptoms as well as um, their functioning of, children, of adults with 22Q. So how well can they function um, once they hit adulthood and what do we, how do we have to prepare families of individuals 22Q so that their um, children can become as functional in adulthood as possible. So a nice um, publication, just a few years old now, looks at some of the functional outcomes in adults with 22Q. I wanted to review just a few pertinent things today. Um, so most of the time, um, most of the time people are not, do not get married with 22Q. You can see the, the yellow box, there's 80% never married, 18% married. But you can also see on this slide that they um, broke it down into three columns where you've got people with intellectual disability, people with a borderline intelligence, and then people um, that are not psychotic and the, in that third column. And so that third column shows you that people that whose psychoses are managed and, that, and are more in the average to borderline intelligence range are much more likely to get married. Um, next slide. Which brings us to the next point if somebody is, and not that you have to be, but if somebody is married, oftentimes they're thinking about expanding their family. And so um, as Sarah had pointed out, that there is a 50-50 chance with um, each child of a person with 22Q deletion that their child will also have that condition. And so you can see that about 20% of individuals with a diagnosis do go on to have children. This may be a little bit undercalled just because there are a lot of people out there that don't know they have 22Q deletion. Um, and so um, it, since it was never identified, they may not have come to medical attention and, and been included in this kind of statistic. Um, next slide. And how do adults with 22Q end up living? Do they live independently? Um, and so um, it, it really varies. So most of the adults end up staying in um, a home type environment um, versus going into a hospital or a, a group home um, where you can see 81% are living in a house or an apartment. And who do they live with, which is the next slide. Um, they um, a few live alone, right around 10, 11 percent. Um, some live with their partner or spouse, uh, but many of them still end up living with their parents or other relatives. Even those that um, have a, that sort of borderline intelligence, they um, often have a lot of um, uh, difficulties with things like executive function. So even if their IQ levels are right around the normal range, they may not be able to do everything that you need to do be able to support living alone with bill paying and things like that. Um, next slide. Um, one kind of functional thing that a lot of people ask about is, is um, do 
people with 22Q deletion, can they get a driver's license? And, and the answer is some. <laughs> some can get a driver's license, but it, it is, it's, not a, it's not a common thing, so only about 20%. Um, so just uh, finishing up talking about that, um, one of the biggest challenges we found in our clinic is that we sort of have to let our patients move on to adulthood. Um, and there's obviously some differences in how um, patients may function depending on their individual abilities and medical conditions. And so this can present a, quite a bit of a challenge for our patients and their families to figure out what the best step is for them. So um, I'm going to let Mindy talk about that because as she mentioned, Lauren is now 22 years old. So she has been figuring this out in real time as we've been in this clinic together. Okay, circling back to Lauren, um, how we came from that place of first getting diagnosed as a little girl to where she is now, age 23, um, has been challenging to say the least. Um, I will say from a parent's perspective, if you get a diagnosis and if you have access to quality medical care in a large institution that um, is able to um, meet the child's needs. I really feel like parents and, and families are supported. Um, I feel like we can manage all, most all of the medical um, challenges. There's tons of therapies out there. We know what to expect. We do um, years and years of all of these therapies and medical interventions. What happens is there's fallouts in between, largely um, through my own experience, but also in talking to other parents that have kids with 22Q is through the school age years, they, they're, they're major pitfalls because one of the things that we see in 22Q is IQ is not necessarily static throughout the lifetime as we see in um, across the board. So for example, with Lauren, when she was younger, I think her first neuropsych evaluation was probably done kindergarten and then maybe one in third grade or so, and she was in the um, average range, I would say mid 80s. And then by the time she was hitting middle school, we saw a 30 point IQ, uh, full scale IQ drop. So she went from a mid, mid 80s down to uh, mid 50s. And so which puts her in the realm of an intellectual disability. So you want to talk about a curveball that you're throwing to the school. It's happening. And so we see Lauren who, you know, essentially has an invisible disability now um, and um, is functioning with somebody who as somebody who has an intellectual disability but the school is still thinking that she um, is I, I feel like the schools aren't catching up with with the diagnosis and so they have the expectations set too high for the kids with 22Q. And so they're already genetically vulnerable to stress and anxiety, and the schools are then putting on pressure, expecting students to um, do things that they're not really able to do. And so it's a recipe for disaster. Um, and I think that as part of our clinical services, you, we support families with um, neuropsych evaluations and helping support the kids through the school age years, but that's something to, really consider um, as we're, you know, seeing kids in clinic is that we may be doing a pretty good job in terms of medically managing them, but we hear lots and lots of cases that the schools are, are really, these kids are falling between the cracks. We've had a couple of cases this past year, uh, in fact, where we were um, consulted um, because Child Protective Services were called. Um, and in both those cases that I'm recalling, completely, completely ended, um, but it was miscommunication between um, maybe frequent absenteeism due to anxiety because the schools are expecting too much from the kids, so there's a lot of avoidance and, and the kids wanting to attend school, um, and then also just some being out due to frequent illnesses. So so there's a lot of pitfall, pitfalls in the education system for the school age child. And so then moving forward, you, we hopefully can get the school on the same page um, as, as the families and um, that are supporting um, the kids and where they're at in terms of if they have an intellectual disability or just a learning disability. Um, and often, like Dr. Meek said, we can have kids that are in the intact range but still have struggles with 
attention or executive functioning concerns. So, so there's a lot to be considered with that um, portion of struggles that families face. And then in terms of um, transition to adulthood, it is even tougher because for families that have established lifelong care with pediatric specialists, um, and in my own personal form was followed by uh, probably a handful or more um, specialists that she needs to continue seeing for life. To find those um, providers all around the same age is just daunting, um, particularly because you have a, a child who is turning into an adult age, so they have adult medicine needs, but they're you know, you have an 18-year-old who is more like a 12-year-old. So it's, it's, it's challenging for families in, in those terms. Um, in terms of the psychiatric care for kids with 22Q, they're at great, great risk. And so this corresponds with um, the time of transition age. And then there's psychiatric stigmas that are prevalent in our society. You couple that with the fact that trying to find good psychiatric adult medicine is very hard. You want to find a psychiatric medicine that accepts insurance is harder. You want to find a psychiatric medicine that accepts Medicaid only is borderline impossible. And then to find a, psychi psych a psychiatrist that um, has experience in um, working with a population of intellectual disabilities on top of um, psychiatric disabilities is really, really challenging. So we experienced this firsthand with Lauren who here I am, I am a care coordinator. I work with uh, experts in 22Q. I am I'm a founder of 22Q Colorado, which is a statewide support group. I sit on the International 22Q Foundation Board. And I, my own kids, experienced a pitfall during transition. So we basically had a psychotic break um, at an adult medicine provider and I couldn't get that psychiatrist to call me back and help manage and find a good um, medication routine for her. So thankfully, I was able to, um, our, pediatric, our pediatric psychiatrist took us back. Um, we were able to reestablish care, get her to a point where she was stable. Um, and then I, you know, journeyed back out on the limb um, and found another, another adult medicine provider that I pay out of pocket for gladly. Um, but again, that can be challenges and barriers for families that don't have the ability to do so. Um, I found a, a, a psychiatrist in the community that um, is skilled, and I have had about a year's time to work with him, and Lauren remains um, stable and is um, has a whole team of people supporting that mental health piece. So she has a psychiatrist, she has a a, a mental health therapist that is familiar with not only like it, you know, mental health in terms of um, psychosis or anxiety, but also familiar working with the developmental disability population. Um, and she goes to a wonderful day program. Um, she's moving into her own apartment this month and she's got lots and lots of support because she's not able to do that fully on her own yet, but it's our goal that we're working towards. So it truly is, um, it takes an entire village to get at least my kid um, <laughs> up and out of place where she really truly is supported enough to live her best life and as be as independent as possible. So I don't know if we wanna open it for questions or if Sarah or Dr. Meeks wanted to add anything. Um. So just to add, we included on our slideshow, which will be uh, eventually available, some resources. Uh, and we've divided them up for family resources, medical professional resources, and some regional ones um, here in Colorado. The medical professional ones are those guidelines that Dr. Meeks had spoken about. Uh, so those can be very helpful um, for care at any point. All right. <laughs> Okay, great slide. I like that. Um, yes, we actually did have a couple of questions come in over our group chat. Um, the first one is, 
Where does Lauren fit on the spectrum of age of diagnosis for 22Q deletion syndrome? And is there a dominant family support organization, organization for this disorder? So oh, I can address that. So as far as age of diagnosis, we kind of see, um, I would say the majority of our patients are diagnosed probably something like 70 to 80 percent of them are diagnosed at birth, likely due to a congenital heart defect or at least multiple congenital anomalies that have resulted in um, a hospitalization. <clears throat> but um, then we do, I would say, have about 20 to 30 percent that um, that do come to attention later. And so we sometimes get um, teenagers that have had develop longstanding developmental delays that are finally getting into genetics clinic and we do get a diagnosis that way. And then in, in, in hindsight, you're like, oh, I guess they were a little bit short and I guess they did have some speech delays and, and things like that. So some of the, um, <clears throat> some of those uh, features are really nonspecific and sort of echo why um, we think it's probably a good idea if you have concern for 22Q or just developmental delays in general, getting at that chromosomal microarray is really beneficial. Um, so um, hopefully that answers that question. It looks like uh, there's another um, individual who's asking about, um, is 22Q11.2 the same as velocardiofacial, the same as DeGeorge, which is, and the same as Sprinson syndrome? Yes, that is, that is correct. Um, the clinical features were described by several different, um, several different medical providers throughout the years before the, um, before the chromosomal cause was known. And so the, um, they all came up with different names for the group of features until we discovered that they were all caused by the same deletion on, 22, on the 22nd chromosome. And so we kind of, we always refer to it as 22Q deletion because we feel like it's the most unifying and the most, uh, you know, factually accurate, um, but uh, you would see, um, you will see it called many different things, even currently in the scientific literature. And I, I might add in the, in the larger 22Q community, there's what we refer to as the same name campaign. Um, we feel like the fact that there are so many different names going around, it further adds to the confusion. So we recommend that all providers refer to it as 22Q deletion versus some of the other older names. Um, Sabrina, there was one. Other, sorry, there was one other question about was it about a family support organization, or I, I missed it. Yeah, it was in addition to the question regarding Lauren. Um, just wanted to know if there was a dominant family support organization for this particular disorder, 22Q deletion syndrome. There is in the state of Colorado a Facebook group that um, I run. We have over 200 members, um, so they could get in touch with me. I think my email ad address is on, included in one of the slides. Um, otherwise, I would refer them to 22q.org. Great, great. It looked like we had one additional question come in from uh, Dr. Palmer. Does the deletion tend to vary significantly um, in size? So the deletion, the, the typical 22Q deletion can be anywhere from 1.5 million bases or DNA letters up to 3 million DNA letters. Uh, most of them tend towards that larger size, 3 million, but, the, um, but we see the whole range. The, whether it's 1.5 or all the way up to 3 million, they, it always encompasses a, a subset of specific genes that are known to be important in causing this condition. Um, but interestingly, we can't correlate the size of the deletion to the features of the deletion, meaning you, it would, you know, it would serve as logical that a 3 million base deletion would make you have more severe or more features than a 1.5 million base deletion but we have not seen that borne out. So there's clearly a lot we don't understand about um, the expression of that, that deletion. Um, hmm. that. Um, I did wanna first and foremost, um, thank our presenters, Drs. Naomi, Naomi Meeks, um, Sarah Stewart and Mindy Taylor for sharing their expertise and presentations today. And thank